So hello and welcome everybody. Um, thank you for uh, attending. Um, this is the National Fellow Online Lecture Series um, that's put on by the AMSSM Online Fellow Education Subcommittee and co-sponsored by the AMSSM Education and Fellowship Committees. Just um, a little reminder, this is meant to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs, educational programming, and provide you with direct access to educational experience with experienced AMSS and members. And it's meant to review topics commonly found on the CAQ exam and preparation for the exam. Um, I'm James Robinson from Hospital for Special Surgery, and I'll be moderating today's lecture. Just a few housekeeping things. Remember to mute your microphone and turn off your video uh, to allow for our optimal performance for the Wi-Fi. Um, if you have questions, please submit them through the chat function. You're welcome to include your name and program if you wish, but you do not have to. Um, and then at the end, um, we will uh, ask those questions and get um, answers to your questions. And then um, at some point in time, towards the end of the lecture, Andy will put a uh, um, link for an evaluation. Please fill that out. That helps us not only um, find out what topics are useful, but um, allows us to um, find out what other topics may be useful for you. So without further ado, it's my pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Nancy Gritter, um, who is going to talk to us today on hypertension and athletes. Uh, so Dr. Gritter went to Indiana Medical School and then did her internal medicine residency at Vanderbilt and also completed her nephrology fel fellowship at Vanderbilt and then practiced um, in the Charlotte, North Carolina area in nephrology and was a consultant with the Carolina Panthers, Panthers during that time. She decided to go back and pursue a sports medicine fellowship at Atrium Health, um, probably making her the only nephrologist sports medicine doctor. Um, we were talking about that earlier. We don't know of any others. Um, and now she also serves as the lead internist for the Carolina Panthers. So um, it is great to have her and on such a topic that um, is very useful and very important to our athletes. So. Without any further ado, you can take it away. Great, great. Thanks, Dr. Robinson, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, am I sharing my screen? Are we good? Yep, we're all good. We can see it. Excellent, excellent. Thanks. Um, uh, yes, uh, I think probably not as sexiest uh, topic as ACP or dislocations and so forth, but uh, uh, I think uh, one that's very important, and you'll, as you'll see, something that's very common. Um, uh, I have no disclosures, financial disclosures uh, for this topic, but as I was saying to Dr. Robinson, I, I probably do have a, a skewed viewpoint. Um, uh, every day, uh, I see the, the end organ effects of, of hypertension in my patient population um, with chronic kidney disease and ESRD, uh, but also in my patient population that are athletes. So I think this is an important topic that we discussed today, and I thank you for the opportunity. Uh, our objectives this evening, uh, we're going to talk about some definitions of hypertension uh, and specifically those uh, guidelines from the American Cardiology Association, American Heart Association as of 2017, uh, its extrapolation to athletes and implication for cardiovascular disease risk. Using case-based examples, I'm going to highlight who, when, and how to screen for secondary causes of hypertension and how to identify and look in which organs we should be uh, uh, screening. Uh, we'll talk briefly about pharmacologic treatment, the threshold to treat, and the agent of choice, uh, and then touch upon some new guidance for the management of stage one hypertension among patients with low cardiovascular disease risk. So hypertension, yes or no? Uh, 130 over 80, 140 over 90. Hypertension, yes or no? A collegiate American style football male athlete, 135 over 80, noted on a first encounter. ADHD on methylphenate, defensive line, BMI categorized as overweight, no family history of hypertension, last year's blood pressure, 128 over 88. Hypertension, yes or no, a collegiate swimmer, female, also 135 over 80, also ADHD, previously on guanfacine. She's a butterflyer, her BMI is normal, she has a family history, mother had onset of hypertension in her 40s. And last year, her blood pressure too, 128 over 88. Hypertension, yes or no. So why does hypertension matter, including in our athletes? 
Well, it's the most common diagnosis, about 103 million U.S. adults, probably 25% of the world population. The incidence and prevalence of hypertension has increased, while yet our rates of hypertension control have declined. It's the most common cardiovascular condition affecting athletes, and we note it in our uh, pre-participation evaluation. And athletes are people too at all levels, at all ages. Uh, and there's this paradox between the exercise benefit to lower blood pressure, decrease mortality versus potentially hypertension being that risk factor, especially potentially in our power athletes. More cardiovascular disease events and premature deaths are attributable to hypertension than any other modifiable risk factor. That includes smoking, lipids, diabetes. Those adults with stage one hypertension have about a twofold increase in cardiovascular disease risk compared to counterparts with normal blood pressure. And even every 20 to 10 millimeter mercury rise in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, there's two times the risk of death from heart disease or stroke. And that begins a log linear fashion to increase in all age groups, even at a systolic blood pressure of 115 or diastolic blood pressure of 75. Even in young people, a cohort of 4,851 adults, Yano demonstrated mean age of 35, those with either elevated blood pressure, stage one hypertension, stage two hypertension, significantly higher rates of cardiovascular disease. So it's not just for our older athlete. And hypertension early in life increases the risk for progression to more severe hypertension, as well as those cardiovascular risk events and mortality. So we moved the dual posts. Um, as I present today, we're, I'm going to present data that supports the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association definition for hypertension. 130 became the new 140, 80 the new 90. Uh, approximately 45% of all U.S. adults have hypertension versus previous definitions, JNC7, JNC8, International Society of Hypertension, and ACP. Uh, American Association of Family Physicians, also uh, the lower target of one, 140 or threshold 140 over 90. So you can see if we look at age-adjusted trend in hypertension, uh, those 18 and year older, older from 1999 to 2018, uh, we see this increase about 2014. So again, approximately 45% of U.S. adults with hypertension by those definitions. What's the implication, the potential impact on these high blood pressure guidelines? We well, see here we've gone from 31 million uh, individuals with hypertension to approximately 40 uh, 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 increase uh, to 103 million, about 45% of the U.S. population. Uh, those that we would recommend pharmacologic treatment, though, the increase is only about 2%. Because truly, many individuals, it would really be non-pharmacologic treatment. Uh, but that represents about 4.2 million U.S. adults. Um, the new definitions, you see some, um, dis the previous disparity amongst different populations, you see some of that equalization, whether it be white, black, Asian, or Hispanic. Um, and then in each of our age groups, those we would recommend treatment, the 130 to 139 over 80 to 89 uh, again, young people ages 25 to 55 now with a diagnosis of hypertension. That lower threshold, though, um, the whole goal would be to reduce cardiovascular events and deaths in the U.S. adults. That would support this new clinical guideline. So these authors use data from hypertensive clinical trials, population cohort to estimate the risk reduction for cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality. And you can see here highlighted in red, the difference between the 2014 and 2017 guidelines, uh, a reduction from 340,000 events to 156, um, uh, a reduction of 340,000 cardiovascular events, a reduction in mortality of 156,000. And even in those individuals less than the age of 60, if we looked at the number needed to treat to prevent one cardiovascular event or one death, significantly lower using the new guidelines from 226 to 91, 390 to 240. Another way of looking at it again, estimate of cardiovascular events prevented using this lower blood pressure threshold. Um, so three 
million cardiovascular events uh, prevented com in comparison to JNC7, JNC8. What about those individuals that have normal blood pressure? What about those individuals without the classically divine cardiovascular risk disease? Um, is there value in defining hypertension, uh, identifying those individuals? So this is the so-called primordial prevention. These are actions that would inhibit the emergence of risk factors. Um, so this is uh, about 1,400 participants um, pre of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, a multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. Uh, so they did not have dyslipidemia, normal LDL, normal HDL. Uh, they did not have diabetes. They uh, were not on treatment for diabetes, hypertension, or dyslipidemia. No current tobacco use. And you can see these were systolic blood pressures between 90 up to 130. And you see this incremental for every 10 millimeter rise in the systolic blood pressure, this incremental increase of coronary calcium scores. Uh, in fact, there is an approximately 53% higher risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease for every 10 millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure. So again, using this detection as a tool and this threshold as a tool, uh, perhaps for even not primary prevention or secondary prevention, but primordial prevention. Now there's concern, is this generalizable to all ages? Um, are we, with these new definitions, lowering these blood pressure thresholds and now labeling people or identifying individuals, um, young individuals with hypertension? Uh, so these authors in JAMA uh, looked at, is this generalizable? Much of the data that supported the lower threshold was uh, from the ACCORD trial and the SPRINT trial. Um, and these, really, these individuals really weren't represented. Those people, the recommendation for treatment of their hypertension were individuals that had a greater than 10% risk of 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease event. And so those calculations aren't applicable for individuals under the age of 40. So the question is raised, are we identifying individuals, uh, labeling them as hypertension, but they're not at increased risk? Um, uh, so we'll, we'll present some data, I hope that supports, again, even in young individuals, um, uh, by identifying hypertension. If stage one hypertension is not um, uh, identified, uh, we potentially are missing out on those people, the primordial risk, uh, prevention, and also reduction in cardiovascular events and mortality. So this is the CARDIA study. So this looks at the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular events amongst participants in the coronary artery risk development in young adults. So it's a prospective cohort of almost uh, 5,000 young adults ages 18 to 30 using the 2017 guidelines. Median follow-up 18 years, almost 20 years, um, looking at cardiovascular events, and there were approximately 228 cardiovascular events, be that coronary disease, heart failure, stroke, TIA, or peripheral arterial disease. And they demonstrated that the hazard risk, the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular events, um, uh, increases uh, respectively whether the individual had elevated blood pressure, stage one hypertension, or stage two hypertension. Uh, so this classification helps identify young adults at higher risk. Additionally, that risk of cardiovascular events is not just with sustained hypertension. Uh, in a multi-ethnic U.S. population, both white coat hypertension, so those individuals who are hypertensive while in the office, and mast hypertension, individuals, blood pressure's fine in the office, but their ambulatory blood pressure, their home blood pressure is elevated. Uh, this is associated with surrogate markers for cardiovascular disease, aortic stiffness, renal injury, and incident cardiovascular events. Uh, so again, you see these, these uh, uh, curves here over a nine-year follow-up. Uh, the incidents were of cardiovascular events for normal tension, for mast hypertension, similar to white coat hypertension, and then sustained hypertension. 
In fact, mass hypertension uh, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in a cohort of pro soccer players, approximately 35% had mass hypertension. Uh, so with the presence of mass hypertension, even those individuals are at increased risk of composite events, cardiovascular events. So in the athlete, I would propose that the definition is the same. These are the categories of uh, blood pressure in adults. Um, so the new guideline, hypertension defined as systolic blood pressure greater than 130 and or a diastolic blood pressure greater than 80. So we look at the average of two or more measurements, um, proper technique, cuff size, seated, no nicotine, no cell phone, no exercise an hour before normal room temperature. And then it has to be confirmed. So greater than two occasions. So these are the classifications, hypertension stage one, that 130 to 139 systolic or 80 to 89, stage two greater than equal to 140 or diastolic greater than 90. The elevated blood pressure, 120 to 129, um, as their systolic blood pressure and, and normal tension. So if the definition is the same, what do we see? What about the prevalence in our athletes and maybe specific to certain sports? So this is a, a, a NFL study that looked at NFL players, 500 NFL players, age matched to the cardia population we talked about before. And they were just looking at cardiovascular risk factors. And so if you look here highlighted in red, uh, the prevalence of hypertension, 13.8% versus 5.5% of age match controls. Prehypertension, 64% versus 24%. And, and remember, these classifications, this was before 2017. So this is not the 130 over 80 threshold. So uh, some of those prehypertensives would actually be defined as hypertensive. And this was for all BMI, all position, all race. How about collegiate athletes? So this is a retrospective cohort. Um, a 13 year period football versus non football at a Division I uh, NC2A institution. And they looked at the prevalence of hypertension uh, and prehypertension in both football athletes and non football athletes. These definitions were hypertension 140 over 90 and prehypertension the 120 to 139. So this would be inclusive of. Uh, stage one hypertension and elevated high, uh, blood pressure. So independent in their initial year of their BMI or other covariates uh, in football athletes, 62% with prehypertension, 19% hypertensive by those definitions. Non-football, 64% prehypertensive, 7% hypertensive. So there's a high prevalence of prehypertension and hypertension in both our football and non-football collegiate athletes. And that's with the, the previous targets, the previous guidelines. This is a prospective study of uh, American style football collegiate male athletes, 113 individuals. They looked at blood pressure, left ventricular parameters for a single season. Uh, and they compared linemen versus non-linemen. Um, and the linemen position, their weight gain, a family of hyper, family history of hypertension were all independent predictors of postseason uh, uh, elevated blood pressure. And the prevalence of concentric LVH, this maladaptive concentric LVH, increased about 31%. And that left ventricular mass correlated with the change in blood pressure. So you see here in panel A, if we look at the linemen, 83% uh, of linemen either were prehypertensive or met criteria for stage one hypertension based on the previous criteria. Where I put the red dotted line, that would be the 2017 guideline. So that would increase your percentage of linemen with stage one and even stage two hypertension. In their prospective study, no one uh, qualified as met criteria for stage one hypertension, but if you lower the threshold, you can see the red line, you do, do have non-linemen with hypertension and elevated blood pressure. This is a study out of Emory, uh, Jonathan Kim et al. looked at 126 collegiate U.S. football athletes and they followed them for three years. 
Uh, and they were looking at left ventricular mass index, uh, structure, diastolic uh, relaxation, arterial stiffness, all surrogates of cardiovascular risk. Uh, they're all adjusted for race, height, and position. And they found that increased systolic blood pressure, increased BMI weight that was associated with concentric LVH and arterial stiffness. Um, that same concentric LVH, they saw it at higher weights, higher systolic blood pressure, and this pulse wave velocity, this measurement of arterial stiffness, and also reduced uh, left ventricular relaxation. Um, so they proposed this term of a maladaptive cardiovascular phenotype, again, correlating with that increase in systolic blood pressure and that increase of weight successively over three years of participation. Female athletes and hypertension, this is an equal opportunity. Uh, this is a study out of two NCAA universities, a report for the World uh, Cardiology Congress, 329 female athletes, eight different sports represented using the guidelines, about 144 individuals categorized as either elevated blood pressure, stage one hypertension or stage two hypertension. Um, Potential suggestion of difference between sports, um, basketball and softball, maybe more of a static or power sport uh, there as well. Uh, and they raise questions about, is there a what's the mechanism? Is there a female athlete's heart or maladaptive uh, phenotype? Uh, and again, exercise-induced cardiac remodeling. Have to mention again our standards for accurate blood pressure measures, uh, measurement. Uh, automated machine is typically better than manual. Uh, you can do a fidelity check at validateBloodPressure.org. Um, two to three measures, average the values. Wait an hour after exercise. You want to confirm this on two at least two separate occasions. Um, and again, home blood pressure measurement is a is a good surrogate. Uh, but quiet room, comfortable temperature, empty bladder, relax, um, you want an accurate assessment. This is a study out, out of Texas I thought was very interesting. It looked at the reliability of either office, home, or ambulatory blood pressure. Uh, and the reliability and a correlation with left ventricular mass index, again, another surrogate marker of cardiovascular disease, um, a, a, a high correlation with home blood pressure measurements. So these were uh, uh, 21 days, two blood pressure measurements in the morning and the evening and looking at the average. So three separate office visits, ambulatory blood pressure, continuous monitoring, or this option to do home, home blood pressure measurement. So I think that's an option uh, for our general patients and our athletes. There are some different patterns of hypertension in our athletes. Sustained systemic hypertension, this is someone's categorized with stage one, stage two hypertension, as we've talked about, an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, interesting, just a 5%, uh, just a three millimeter drop in systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure uh, can result in a 5% decrease in cardiovascular mortality. So minimal reduction with an improvement in outcome. We talked briefly about white coat hypertension. So elevated in the office, normal ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring. Um, so it, this emphasizes the importance of using the home blood pressure monitoring average uh, because there is an association with dysmetabolic risk, asymptomatic organ damage, increased risk of cardiovascular events, and, and potentially those primordial prevention elements. Mast hypertension, so again, normal in the office, elevated outside of the office. Uh, there seems to be a higher prevalence in our younger athletes. Um, two separate reports of a cohort of middle-aged endurance athletes, 38% with mast hypertension. And then I mentioned before, 35% in a cohort of pro soccer players. This too associated with increased dysmetabolic risk, asymptomatic organ damage, cardiovascular risk, and future risk of sustained hypertension. Two other patterns, the, the hypertensive response to exercise. So this is on an exercise tense, uh, test that there's a difference in your peak systolic blood pressure compared to baseline um, of more than 60 or a peak systolic blood pressure of 210 uh, in men or a peak systolic uh, blood pressure 190 in women. 
uh, or a difference of 50. This is associated with a risk of hypertension and greater cardiac remodeling. Again, that static power. Um, so potentially a sport specific risk. Isolated systolic hypertension, very common in the young, uh, also equates with a risk of sustained hypertension later in life and cardiovascular risk greater than the general population. Uh, so, so stage two isolated systolic hypertension, that greater than 140, has a higher risk of cardiovascular events even than stage one systolic and diastolic hypertension. So a few pearls about our athletes with hypertension. Again, the, the most common cardiovascular finding at our pre-participation uh, examination, initial visit, can be elevated blood pressure or hypertension. That individual may continue to participate until their follow-up blood pressure check. Remember, we need greater than two occasions to diagnose. Exception would be called stage three or accelerated hypertension greater than 180 or diastolic blood pressure 120 without proximate etiology, symptoms or signs of target organ damage, that person would be held out until evaluation completed. There's a similar age appropriate workup as our general population. Um, you want to emphasize that family history and review of systems looking for symptoms associated either with target organ damage or secondary causes of hypertension. Remember the white coat, remember the mass hypertension, they carry that intermediate cardiovascular risk. And consider those special patient populations with a potential risk profile, the American football athlete, the increased BMI, someone with family history, potentially position group, and as we suggested, even female athletes, specific sports. They may warrant earlier, closer follow-up, uh, confirmation with ambulatory blood pressure, home blood pressure monitoring, um, and in that competitive athlete, specific testing, uh, again, looking for those surrogate markers. Medication history, very important. Um, stimulants, supplements, caffeine, alcohol, recreational drugs, ergogenic agents, uh, systemic corticosteroids, anabolic steroids, testosterone analogs, oral contraceptives, NSAIDs, uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents, um, uh, all associated with hypertension. Our laboratory studies for our routine workup for athletes with hypertension, our general population, again, looking for the hypertension mediated organ damage or associated conditions. Uh, your routine blood counts, fasting glucose, BMP, looking again, BUN and creatinine, your estimated GFR, uh, potentially your cystatin C, uh, basic electrolytes, lipid profile, thyroid function tests, urine studies, looking specifically for uh, albumin, abnormal proteinuria, EKG, uh, and then special tests, uh, looking for causes of secondary hypertension. And we'll talk briefly about who do we screen, who should we work up, Certainly someone with abrupt onset, uh, exceeding those targets of, of stage three hypertension, age less than 30 or hypertension onset uh, under the uh, 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 pre-pubertal, um, uh, uh, target organ damage, elevated protein in the urine, unprovoked or excessive hypokalemia, um, a younger adult with brachial femoral lag looking for potentially coarctation, an older adult with isolated uh, diastolic blood pressure elevation. In our athletes, Rimaldi et al. suggested that this may account for 5 to 10 percent of diagnosed hypertension or athletes' secondary causes, a treatable form of hypertension and potentially reversible. Uh, also need to consider obstructive sleep apnea. Do they have the phenotype? Do they have the history? Again, a secondary cause of hypertension. So again, primary hypertension, that gradual rise, um, slow rate of rise in blood pressure, lifestyle factors that, that favor hypertension, family history of hypertension versus secondary hypertension, the most common causes here in red. Um, but that blood pressure, lability, dizziness, pheochromocytoma, obstructive sleep apnea, parenchymal kidney disease or renal vascular disease, primary hyperaldosteronism, and, and again, the medications we talked about, substance uses contributing to secondary causes of hypertension. Um, uh, I'll make a note in primary hyperaldosteronism, only 50% of hypokalemia, the diagnosis really should reside in the, the, the presence and, and detection of renin suppression. 
work up for athletes, I think should include an echo and in, in, certainly in specific populations, if their hypertension is sustained for a longer period, six months, if their EKG is abnormal, if they have symptoms, um, if uh, their blood pressure is resistant to lifestyle modifications and antihypertensive therapy, and certainly the, the highly competitive uh, um, uh, elite level uh, athlete with hypertension. We talked about that maladaptive uh, phenotype. We're trying to distinguish target organ damage, hypertensive heart disease as a cardiovascular risk from a normal athlete exercise-induced cardiac remodeling. Uh, looking at wall thickness, chamber dimension, what's pathologic, concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with diminished left ventricular volume, so it's more in the mass of the, of the muscle versus the more adaptive eccentric LVH or mild concentric LVH, but an enlarged chamber size and preserved left ventricular function. Modification of activity, restriction, appropriate medical therapy uh, would be indicated if pathologic concentric LVH. Uh, and certainly if non-pathologic findings or just athlete's heart, we still need to treat the hypertension. So this illustrates from the working group in 2017, kind of the updated classification system, um, the classification for elevated blood pressure, stage one hypertension, stage two hypertension. Everybody gets non-pharmacologic therapy. And then those individuals with stage one, if they have known atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or 10-year risk greater than 10%, um, pharmacologic therapy is indicated. Anyone with stage two hypertension, non-pharmacologic and introduce blood pressure lowering drugs. Um, if it's stage one, but you have diabetes or chronic kidney disease, or you're over the age of 65, those individuals should be treated with antihypertensive therapy. This is an update in 2021, recognizing that there, there was a guidance gap. What do we do? Our, our, our formulas for predicting risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, they're not validated for those individuals less than 40. Um, so what if there's no atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? If their cardiovascular risk is less than 10% or they're less than 40 and those risk profiles don't apply, um, those individuals should have lifestyle modification, non-pharmacologic management, reassessment in three, three to six months. If blood pressure is still above goal, stage one hypertension, then consider initiation of pharmacologic therapy. Again, these would be individuals without identified target organ damage or so associated clinical syndromes. So not only is our threshold for diagnosis, but our treatment goals for those individuals that we make the determination we're gonna treat, um, that treatment goal is less than 130 over 80. So our non-pharmacologic therapy, it's, it's, it's impressive uh, the, the, the impact you can have on someone's blood pressure with weight loss, sodium restriction, a heart healthy diet, a higher potassium, lower sodium, limiting alcohol use, uh, certainly aerobic activity, resistance training, uh, average of anywhere from four to five millimeter drop in blood pressure just with these non-pharmacologic -pharm measures. From a pharmacologic standpoint, again, the goal, less than 130 systolic, diastolic blood pressure, less than 80. In our athlete population, we got to consider the individual, we got to consider their sport, we got to consider if there's restrictions in the sport, uh, what's allowable, what's prohibited. Uh, but typically, our first line agent for stage one hypertension is similar to our general patient population ACE and ARBs, RAS inhibition, or a long acting calcium channel blocker. If stage two hypertension oftentimes start out as a low dose uh, ACE inhibitor or an ARB, but if you're gonna require two drugs, different classes, oftentimes using that combination, not maxing out the ACE or the ARB, but using low doses of two different classes. Uh, a few pearls here, RAS inhibition, uh, angioedema, five times higher in black and Latinx race. Uh, there's a 10% cross-reactivity ACE inhibitor and ARB for angioedema. And certainly ACE inhibitors, higher incidence of cough, uh, but about a 30% of those individuals who cough with an ACE inhibitor might cough with an ARB. Uh, and despite 
previous um, learnings, RAS inhibition is not inferior for cardiovascular disease prevention in black race, Latinx race. So here are guidelines, recommendations by blood pressure. So normal blood pressure, healthy lifestyle, reassess the blood pressure annually, elevated blood pressure, non-pharmacologic therapy, and reassess. Stage one hypertension based on the pressure ranges. If they have cardiovascular disease or their risk is greater than 10%, non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic therapy, ACE or ARB, reassess the blood pressure in a month, and then if not at, if at goal, reassess every three to six months. If not at goal, assess for adherence and then potential intensification of therapy. Remember diabetics, chronic kidney disease over the age of 65, the recommendation would be treatment with pharmacologic agent, even if just stage one hypertension. If no cardiovascular disease, 10 year risk less than 10% or their age is such that you can't validate that risk, Again, non-pharmacologic therapy, but reassess in three to six months. So again, that's this new gap uh, recommendation. Stage two hypertension greater than equal to 140 over 90, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapy. So let's end up here with a couple of cases to, to, to demonstrate what we've learned. So again, a few assumptions. We're talking about older than 17, we're in the US. I'm gonna use the ACC AHA guidelines. These are accurate blood pressure measurements based on the, the features that we described or potentially using home blood pressure monitoring or ambulatory monitoring for those who to screen for white coat hypertension or mast hypertension. So here's Dr. Lineman, uh, follow up on a blood pressure at their pre-participation examination. He's 135 over 80 times two measurement. He's 20 years old, college sophomore, changed from tight end to defensive end this season. He has ADHD, primarily inattentive, and he's on methylphenolate. Uh, he's a biology major, he's pre-med, no family history of hypertension. Again, note the half-light of methylphenidate about three and a half hours. So he stopped his stimulant 14 days ago, well washed out, no other meds, no NSAIDs. Review systems, significant, no real phenotype or symptomatology to suggest uh, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, no tremor, no rash, no pallor. He does get up to urinate two times a night. It's a 20 year old, no peripheral edema. His blood pressure his first year was 128 over 88. He was about 210, BMI of 24.7. He's now 140 over 82 times two. His weight's up to 238. His BMI is 27.5. Normal examination, normal cardiovascular examination, no rash, no stria. So he's not on potentially confounding medication. He's a football player. He's a lineman. He's had a BMI increase from first year to second year. He's had a systolic blood pressure increase and he has this symptom of nocturia. Examination is non-revealing, careful readings, average of two is 140 over 82. So he is stage two hypertension. We grade up, if you meet the category for systolic, that's the category you fall into. So either if one systolic or diastolic is above that category, uh, you designate to the higher blood pressure category. So should he undergo a secondary cause workup? Yes, new onset hypertension, age of 20, no family history. Um, uh, these are features at stage two at diagnosis. These are features that should warrant a secondary workup. So our usual testing performed. We couldn't get through a nephrologist lecture without seeing an abnormal creatinine. So a creatinine of 2.14 is estimated GFR is 40. Uh, this is really inappropriate target organ damage for his new onset hypertension. 24-hour urine, his creatinine clearance is 62 milliliters per minute. Renal ultrasound, he's got asymmetry of his kidney size, no evidence of Doppler evidence of renal artery stenosis, bland urine, no albuminuria. So real case, this lineman studying to be a doctor had a congenital abnormality of kidney and urinary tract. He has a small hypoplastic right kidney with low-grade obstruction on the left. 
Uh, Rena Graham demonstrates 65% of the function coming from the left, 35% of the function from the right. So stage two hypertension with stage three chronic kidney disease, this is a secondary cause, a renal parenchymal disease causing hypertension. Um, first line treatment, RAS inhibition, and put in a plug, refer to the nephrologist. How about Madam Butterfly? So this is a young woman, she's 22, she's a collegiate swimmer. Uh, she had a prior elevated blood pressure that was attributed to a stimulant and oral contraceptives. So both are now discontinued. Her blood pressure improved and she was actually taking guanfacine, which is a centrally acting alpha agonist for ADHD, but she stopped that due to constipation and weight gain. So she's an engineering major and family history is significant. Her mother had hypertension in the fourth decade. Here's her blood pressure, 146 over 85, unremarkable examination. Her basic labs, unremarkable. Does she deserve a secondary hypertensive workup? You bet, she's less than 30, previously controlled. And I would argue that her blood pressure was probably masked by the alpha-2 agonist, also a centrally active and antihypertensive. So once she was off that, we saw the real blood pressure. So these were the entities that you would consider. She had a normal renal ultrasound and Doppler. Her FIO workup was negative. Her potassium was normal. Remember only 50% of those individuals with hyperaldo have hypokalemia, uh, but the linchpin, plasma renin activity, less than one. Her plasma aldo concentration was 10, but a 24 hour urine aldosterone was greater than 12 micrograms per day. So this is hyperaldosteronism. She ended up having a right adrenal adenoma as the cause of her hypertension. So some final take-home points, again, defining it by the ACC AHA 217 guideline. We talked a little bit by the prevalence and by age, gender, and sport. Uh, certainly there's caution due to extrapolation from a higher risk population that define the guidelines, um, but I hope I demonstrated that risk is there. Uh, the cardiovascular risk of hypertension, the specific subsets in our athletes, that synergy with BMI, body surface area, sports specific, and that maladaptive phenotype. Our evaluation, we wanna identify the secondary causes and we wanna assess for target organ damage and associated clinical conditions, atrial fibrillation, heart failure, chronic kidney disease. Certainly pharmacologic therapy in athlete, if indicated, uh, you have to consider your population, their performance, and if it's permitted, and we don't really have the time to touch on sports el el eligibility with hypertension, and it probably depends on your recommending society. Uh, but the American Heart Association would say in stage one hypertension provided no evidence of organ damage, there's no limit as long as the blood pressure is controlled. Stage two hypertension, consideration of restricting high static sports in, in, uh, until the blood pressure is controlled. If other cardiovascular disease or associated clinical condition, again, a case-by-case -case assessment. I think there's areas for future study uh, for those enterprising fellows on the line. Um, uh, and I'll, if we have the opportunity, I think we've got some time. Uh, I'd like to just share a few questions that would be kind of a CAQ type board type question. Uh, we don't have the polling up, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll give everybody a, a chance to think of their answer in their mind. So here's a 20-year-old male collegiate track and field athlete. He presents for his pre-participation physical evaluation. You note know a blood pressure 135 over 80. You repeat it two weeks later in the clinic. It's a blood pressure 132 over 78. So two measures, averaged, more than two measurements, 132 over 78. Based on 2017 guidelines, this athlete should be diagnosed with, and here are our options, normal blood pressure, elevated blood pressure, stage one hypertension, stage two hypertension. So the answer is stage one hypertension. Again, remember our categories, two careful readings, two separate occasions, and remember you grade up. Um, if the diastolic blood pressure categorizes them as stage one, you go with the higher category. Question two, 
18-year-old female rower presents for follow-up from urgent care visit after an acute asthma exacerbation. Mild intermittent asthma and ADHD. She's on oral contraceptive pills, methylphenidate, albuterol is needed, and she was just started on a five-day course of prednisone at the urgent care. Which of her current medications is least likely to cause elevated blood pressure? Albuterol, methylphenidate, oral contraceptive pill, prednisone, least likely. And the answer is albuterol. Certainly can get some reflex tachycardia with albuterol use, but the stimulant, the oral contraceptive, steroidal and non-steroidal preparations can all be associated with hypertension. And our final question, 28-year-old competitive female triathlete with no family history of hypertension is diagnosed with new onset stage two hypertension. Three separate in-office measurements, the average of seven days of home blood pressure assessment. She's on no medications. She does complain of muscle cramping, weakness, and palpitations. As her team primary physician, in addition to obtaining EKG, BMP, CBC, urinalysis, albumin creatinine ratio, what should you recommend? Initiate on a thiazide, let her race this weekend. Quantify circulating renin level. Check her thyroid function tests. Both B, C, and E and E renal ultrasound with Doppler. So again, what this question is targeting in is the recognition that she should have a workup for secondary causes uh, of hypertension. Um, and you would proceed with that evaluation. You could have a corollary question, should this individual complete uh, compete? A corollary question, uh, she's a competitive female triathlete, uh, recommendation for echocardiogram in this individual. So the answer is D, both C, B, C, and E. That wraps it up from my standpoint, Dr. Robinson. I'm, I'm happy to entertain any questions if there are any. Well, great. That was fantastic. Thank you for that. That was a great overview and um, lots of uh, great studies and literature. Um, we did have one question from our audience already put in. If you have any other questions, please enter them in the chat. Um, and uh, one of the fellow Dr. Uh, Michael Johnson had asked if we sh if we can't um, guarantee specific conditions out fine for checking an appropriate blood pressure, should we even check a blood pressure at all? Uh, yeah, you bring up a great question. Uh, I I do think that sometimes that's our only opportunity to capture that athlete. Um, so I think we should do a blood pressure. Um, but I think that would be the individual that there might be people that you're going to have to bring back uh, to the office, consider ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, uh, or that home blood pressure average uh, assessment. Uh, but I understand a lot of the pre-participation evaluation or kind of this herd mentality, and everybody's going group to group, uh, station to station, not ideal. Um, but, but I think that sometimes is our, our moment of access to that athlete to pick up that person that might be at risk. Great. Um, kind of along that center line, I kind of have a question, you know, we started, um, you know, a few years ago where, you know, in like an orthopedic office, no one would ever check a blood pressure. And then the recommendations came out, oh, you should be checking blood pressure, um, from, uh, some of the billing companies. Um, and what, it, like, what would be your response to what should happen? You know, we often see these people that have really elevated blood pressures in the orthopedic clinic. And a lot of the times we attribute to pain or, you know, um, decreased exercise ability and then walking them from the waiting room and things like that. But um, what kind of would you, uh, what would be your recommendation for our fellows as they get in our clinic when they see people with very elevated blood pressures in their clinic? Yeah, I think you look at those confounding factors. So you just described, right? They just walked. They just didn't. They didn't sit there for three to five minutes. They were probably pay, playing on their phone while while they were waiting. Uh, they have an injury. They have pain. They might be on NSAID. So again, those are confounding factors. So that's just someone that you're going to have to follow up. And the recommendation would be that they follow up. Um, 
and I think if you gave them the opportunity to sit quietly, if you don't have the confounding factors, if you take an accurately measured blood pressure, you might see a different result. Um, but I don't think it obviates the, the need uh, to, to screen or pay attention. Um, if not, why do it? Um, Great. Yeah. Um, kind of a, um, another. And I will mention to... sometimes you'll see, you know, they, that the orthopedist is not to pick on the, but they picked up the little wrist cuff and so forth. Again, you wanted a validated blood pressure. And really the recommendation is an automated blood pressure should be a brachial upper arm cuff. It's got to be the right size for our athletes. So again, it, it, it's a challenge, but, but I, I think, um, uh, we probably underestimate then the prevalence amongst amongst our athletes of hypertension. Um, one of the questions that just came through, do you have a preference for 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring versus the patient keeping a log over a week or so? Uh, my preference is for my general patient population and my athlete is the, the home blood pressure monitoring. If you teach them to do it right, validated blood pressure cuff. I get two measurements in the morning, two measurements in the evening, seven days, I've got 28 measurements to average. Um, I can't find a blood pressure cuff to ambulatory uh, blood pressure cuff to fit my, some of my athletes. So I think that's a challenge. Uh, sometimes it malfunctions, et cetera. So again, if I, if I can send them home with a cuff and they do the home, uh, and, and I think it's been validated that it correlates with those end organ markers that we're looking for. Great. Um, you know, we've kind of mentioned a lot about, um, secondary causes and medicines that we may, that uh, athletes may be on. And a lot of our athletes are on stimulants, either ADHD medicine, uh, a lot of our female athletes on oral contraceptives. Um, how long would you have them off, especially like an oral contraceptive before, um, if their blood pressure was still elevated, saying they have hypertension? Yeah, I think with the stimulants, obviously we can we can look at the, the half-life of the medication. I think in the uh, uh, female athlete on oral contraceptives, I, I, I would recommend that you allow to go through several cycles before making that uh, making that determination. Great. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions that I had. I want to thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, a very important topic and something that our fellows are going to see a lot in practice. A lot of elevated blood pressures in our athletes is quite common um, and probably more common than we even realize. So um, thank you for that. Thanks for the invitation.